Hello, I'm Dr. Scott Emmons. I'm a professor of neuroscience and genetics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And uh, I'm going to tell you today about research that my group has been carrying out together with my colleague David Hall at Einstein uh, on the nervous system of a tiny worm, a tiny nematode worm uh, known as C. norabditis elegans, or C. elegans for short. Um, what we have done is we've determined the connectome of the uh, part of the nervous system in the male worm that guides the male's mating behavior. Now, by connectome, we refer to uh, uh, the sum total of all the synaptic connections in a nervous system. Uh, so, as we know, uh, the, the uh, brain is an enormous uh, connection, a network of neurons. Neurons are connected together in circuits. And uh, we need to know what those circuits are to understand how the brain functions. Now, uh, the Obama's Brain Initiative uh, has been uh, begun to try and uh, advance our understanding in basic ways about how the brain functions. And, and one of the important aspects that they emphasize is uh, the concept of mapping. They, they talk about mapping at several levels, at the level, the cellular and molecular level, uh, showing it, uh, gene expression patterns across the brain, uh, activity uh, mapping, showing how different parts of the brain uh, are active. And we heard about that activity mapping from Raphael Just in another lecture in this series yesterday. Uh, third level is that of connectivity, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. This is the physical connections between the neurons uh, that create the circuits in the brain. Uh, and then we have the level of functional mapping, to showing which uh, functions are mapped to different regions of the brain. And finally, conceptual uh, mapping, uh, uh, trying to understand how our minds and our consciousness, our memory, behavior emerge from our brains. Uh, so as I said, uh, the um, uh, the emphasis, what, what I'm going to talk about, mapping level, is that at the level of uh, connectivity, synaptic connectivity of the neurons. Uh, so uh, the circuits in the brain are connected by, uh, by synapses between the neurons. Uh, and uh, to create a map of these synapses and uh, define the circuits, uh, we need to use the technique of electron microscopy. Uh, now this is because synapses being subcellular structures are smaller than the wavelength of light. They're below the resolution of a light microscope, and we have to use an electron microscope to observe them. Uh, unfortunately, the EM technique is, is inadequate to map a large structure such as the brain. To give you an idea uh, what that challenge would be like, imagine uh, the continent of Europe or, say, the, the entire United States uh, covered, surface covered with little circles about an inch in diameter, three centimeters in diameter, circles covering the entire surface of the United States. And your job is to map these little circles. Unfortunately, you can't see them. The only way to see these circles is with a special camera. So you get this camera and you start to use it and you find this camera takes pictures that are only one yard or one meter on a side. So you have these one square meter pictures that you have to cover the entire the United States, the lower 48 states, the continent of Europe, uh, with these one square meter pictures. And then you have to analyze each one. We'll have about a thousand of these little circles in it. You have to name each one. And then you have to connect one circle to another across the, uh, the different images. Uh, you would have eight trillion of these photographs of the surface. So this is the tiny size of an electron micrograph compared to the size of our brain would be comparable to this problem. So uh, how, what, how can we proceed to find the circuits in our brain? So uh, again, in Just's, uh, Raphael Just's lecture, he quoted the famous English molecular biologist Sidney Brenner saying that uh, science advances uh, in, in steps, uh, first technology improvements, uh, improvement in experimental observations, and finally in theory. And he said probably in that order. And uh, the Brain Initiative uh, emphasizes the improvement in techniques and technologies that's going to be necessary to determine the structure and function of the brain. Um, so in my analogy of, of mapping uh, these little circles in the United States, you could, for example, get a bigger camera that, that takes a bigger picture than one square meter. Uh, and people are taking this approach to the electron microscopy. Uh, trying to make bigger EM images and rapid uh, uh, computerized methods for uh, analyzing them. Um, it's ironic, actually, that Brenner would uh, mention these three uh, approaches to advancement because he's actually famous for taking what is really a fourth approach. 
uh, when we're faced with a problem, intractable problem like mapping the circuits in the brain. This has happened over and over again in biology with an intractable problem. Uh, we approach it by trying to find the same phenomena, but in a much simpler format, smaller and simpler format. Uh, and this is what uh, Brenner did by choosing the uh, nematode worm for analysis of the function of the nervous system. So C. elegans uh, is a millimeter long, uh, grows on petri plates, it eats bacteria in the lab. It's a very inexpensive research. There are two sexes, uh, a male and a female. The female makes her own sperm, so she's functionally a hermaphrodite. So we refer to her as a hermaphrodite. Now, the hermaphrodite nervous system has 302 neurons in it, and the male has 383 neurons. And we know these numbers very precisely because a, a remarkable feature of these nematode worms is that they're, they're cellularly identical from individual to individual. Each individual is made up of the same cells, same number of neurons, same number of gut cells, skin cells, muscles, and so forth, uh, precisely the same. And these can be mapped out. And uh, in fact, uh, the connections in this small nervous system can be determined by electron microscopy. So it was in the 19, late 1960s that Brenner, who had been already famous for work on the genetic code, uh, looked around, as I said, for a simple model system where he could tackle the major problems of the nervous system. Um, and he wanted to use a genetic approach, which had been shown to be so powerful in, in deciphering the genetic code. Uh, and C. elegans was very good for genetics, and he wanted to determine the complete synaptic connectivity by serial section electron microscopy, and then he wanted to study how this circuitry functions and how it's formed and, and what is the genetic basis for its formation. So two major problems, how does the nervous system work and how is the nervous system built? Now, since uh, Brenner selected the worm for study. The field has grown uh, in, in dramatic ways and, and gone in all directions of biology. Some of the most important uh, discoveries in C. elegans, in fact, are at the level of cell biology. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the power of C. elegans as an experimental system arises primarily because of its tiny size. So let me re just reemphasize that. Um, comparing the worm to the, the size of your brain. So here's a cross-section through your neocortex showing the, the six layers uh, of, of the neocortex and some pyramidal neurons, about two to four millimeters uh, thick. Here's the size of C. elegans, millimeter long. Here's the region of the nervous system that we have determined the connectivity of the neurons in. And this little square is the size of the electron micrographs that we have to use. So you can see that uh, that is tiny size compared to the enormous size of the brain, and uh, you need something as small as the elegans to use this approach to, at this, at this point in time, uh, define synaptic connections in the nervous system. Um, so one might reasonably ask, uh, given the tiny size of the worm and the simple number of neurons in its nervous system, can this possibly be uh, a reasonable model for understanding something like our brain? And uh, in fact, uh, C. elegans is a very typical animal, and its nervous system does what all animal nervous systems do. Um, it takes sensory input from the environment. It uh, evaluates that information to make a decision, and the worm has to decide, what should I do? And then finally, having made that decision, it has to execute the motor program for that output, whether locomotion or turning or mating. Um, and uh, so this is what all nervous systems do. They are input-output devices. Uh, which make computations. Um, and the, uh, the information that C. elegans has for guiding its behavior uh, come from environmental cues. It has many sensory neurons facing the environment. It has sensory neurons facing its internal physiology. It, has, it evaluates its, whether it's hungry or hot and so forth. Um, it, uh, it takes sensory information from its past experience. A worm will remember where it last found food in terms of temperature and salt uh, and remembers those uh, parameters and will seek food by returning to those uh, values. Uh, motivational state, the worm has various needs at different times to eat, uh, to stay cool, uh, to mate. And uh, so all of this information is uh, brought together in the nervous system and then uh, has uh, used to make a decision and to guide uh, sets of behaviors. Um, it has the same 
motivated, purposeful behaviors as all animals see elegans. It has to find food, it has to stay safe, it has to disperse, it has to reproduce. Uh, so finding food, it will keem attacks towards food, it can detect chemical gradients, and as I said, it will remember where it last found food. Um, for staying safe, that may be, not be so, uh, so straightforward. And I'm going to show you some movies of, of worm behavior. Um, here, for example, you will see C. elegans uh, being devoured by a predaceous nematode bigger than itself. Uh, so go ahead, Tracy, run that movie. Ouch. All right, in the next uh, movie, um, a worm, a C. elegans worm encounters a buffer that has previously had Persianchus in it. Go ahead, uh, uh, Tracy, run the next movie. That went a little bit quick. You missed the first uh, backup, but you, you see the worm is uh, repelled by uh, the buffer that it normally would like to swim in. Uh, next, uh, it, it, there's more than predatory nematodes that would like to eat C. elegans. There are fungi. Uh, and so uh, watch here. This fungus makes little lariats that trap worms. Okay, go, uh, Tracy, go ahead, run that one. The worm goes through the lariat, the, the lariat constricts, and the worm is caught and is digested. Now, worms know about uh, this as well. Uh, so here you'll see a worm. In, in, in this uh, uh, next movie, you'll see a worm approach the lariat right here. Worms have uh, light sense, touch sensors uh, in their heads that can detect that they're run through this larry and they back up and they have a behavioral um, inhibition uh, that prevents them from wagging their head as they back up and so they can slip out of these lariats. Uh, go ahead, Tracy, next one. It swims away to live another day. So that's uh, staying safe in your environment uh, for dispersal. Uh, the um, uh, worms have a dispersal stage called a dower, uh, which is desiccation resistant, arrest uh, development, does not feed. Uh, and uh, dowers have a, spe a specific behavior called nictating behavior, in which they climb up on things, and they can even climb up in towers of, of each other, and they stand on their tails and wave their heads. Uh, go ahead, Tracy, run this movie. Okay, 
Uh, there's another species of nematode that uh, doesn't wait for a passing insect. They, they, the downwards are standing on their tails, waving their heads so that they get picked up by a passing uh, insect and they get dispersed that way. Uh, there's a, um, another nematode species uh, called uh, Steiner nema um, that uh, uh, doesn't wait for a passing insect. Now, wa watch this movie where the little red arrow is. Go ahead and uh, uh, play the movie, uh, Tracy. Can you play it once more? That goes kind of quick. All right, if you want to know where that worm went, you have to use a, uh, a high-speed camera. Uh, and uh, in the, uh, this, the next movie, uh, uh, watch this. What happens here? Uh, go ahead, Tracy. They jump. Finally, uh, for um, uh, for uh, m m reproduction, now I'll, I'll show you a, a movie. Uh, one panel looks like this. It has a male with two mating partners uh, on a uh, bacterial lawn on an auger surface, and this male with mating partners will sometimes mate, but most of the time just wander around the lawn, but it will never leave the lawn. Uh, and then in the other panel, you'll see a male alone, and a male alone will not stay on this bacterial lawn. It makes excursions off the lawn and eventually takes off. So the male with mates will always stay with them and never leave the food, whereas a male alone will leave food in order to find mates. Uh, play the movie, Tracy. So, a male uh, is not happy if it's not with mates. Um, so, uh, the, uh, uh, it's important, so, so male, the worm has all of these complex behaviors, just like all animals do. Uh, uh, and uh, in fact, it's important to, to know that uh, its nervous system is very similar to ours in, in many ways. And uh, it's, the common ancestor of worms and humans must have had a rather advanced nervous system because a large portion of the genes uh, is conserved from worms to humans. Uh, their universal mechanisms in cell biology have been discovered in worms like RNAi and microRNA, programmed cell death. Uh, the components of the nervous system uh, are the same, use the same proteins, neurotransmitters, neuromodulators, receptors, channels, synaptic components, so dopamine, acetylcholine, serotonin, all of these things. There are neuropeptides. Uh, oxytocin, for example, is a neuropeptide that governs our uh, social and sexual behaviors, and it's uh, required for the males to express that mate searching behavior, which I just showed you. So um, it's reasonable to suppose that by studying the circus, so all these molecular components arose in the common ancestor of worms and humans. That's why they're the same in the two. Uh, and so by studying the circuits in C. elegans, uh, we may be able to gain insight into the nature of the ancestral circuitry um, in which these molecular components of our nervous system evolves. So uh, with confidence that uh, C. elegans is going to tell us something uh, important about uh, our nervous system, uh, Brenner, um, undertook to determine the, uh, his, his 
group, his research group, John White in particular, to, to um, determine the connectivity in the C. elegans nervous system. So first, a little primer about the C. elegans nervous system. On the top, the hermaphrodite, on the bottom, the male. Uh, there's a nerve ring in the head, uh, which is more or less the brain of the worm. There's a ventral nerve cord, and then a small ganglion in the tail. And in the male, this posterior ganglion is, is much more uh, is much larger and more complex. And this is the region of the nervous system that we have determined the connectivity for. Um, so the um, electron microscope is used to, uh, to determine the connections in this nervous system. Uh, here we look at a cross section through the posterior of the nerve ring, and it, uh, one of these electron micrographs is shown here. There's the cuticle of the worm, uh, body wall muscles, the pharynx, which is muscular structure which pumps in the bacteria for feeding. And uh, here is the ventral ganglion. Uh, here is a blow up of that region. You can see what a large proportion of the worm's body, in fact, is made up of its nervous system. Now here you're seeing on the right the cross sections of the neurons. Uh, and here we are at higher magnification of what this looks like in the electron microscope. Uh, so here are synaptic densities that we use to score uh, the presence of synapses. There's another one presynaptic density, synaptic vesicles. Um, here I showed you at the very same magnification a bit of rat hippocampal uh, nervous system section with the EM. And it's remarkable how similar the C. elegans nervous system is to mammalian nervous system. Here we see the synaptic densities, uh, synaptic vesicles, the sizes, the cross sections of the neurites are similar. Uh, and as I said, this, this seems quite remarkable that you can almost hardly tell them apart. So. Uh, in 13 years of effort, uh, Brenner's group, uh, led by John White, uh, determined the connections in the nervous system of the hermaphrodite. 5,000 chemical synapses, 2,000 neuromuscular junctions, 600 gap junctions. And they published this in 1986 and taking up an entire 350-page volume of the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. Uh, there's uh, a page in this uh, volume for each neuron and lists of synapses and representative EMs showing the synapses and, and the location of, the, of each neuron uh, for all the 302 neurons of the hermaphrodite. Um, this has been the absolute bible for C. elegans research. This has been the foundation for neuroscience research, highly productive, uh, since that time. Um, there's, you'll sometimes hear that we've known the connections in the C. elegans nervous system uh, for over 20 years, and we still don't understand how the nervous system works, so it's not very important to get the connectivity. This is really quite a misconception. Uh, some of the connections in the hermaphrodite connectome were immediately interpretable. Uh, the um, lo locomotion circuit, we could tell from the motor neurons how it went forward, how it went backwards, uh, command interneurons that uh, determine the switch between forward and backward locomotion, the circuits from by which the worm responds to light touch to go forward and backward. These were all immediately interpretable. Um, and now, to be sure, there are many other parts of this complex circuit that can't be immediately uh, interpreted, but that doesn't mean it's not important to have it. They, they uh, are what you need to then go forward further with experimental work guided by the known connectivity uh, to determine uh, how it works. Uh, so. Um, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, Dave Hall and I decided it was time to uh, get more connectomes. Now, the Brenner group tried to computerize the process of determining the connectivity, uh, but computers were too small uh, and slow uh, at the time that they were doing this work. They were way ahead of the time, and so they did their reconstruction from uh, paper prints, analogous to those prints I, I mentioned of the crossing of the United States, uh, but in this case, uh, can, you can cover a, a worm. Um, marking the paper prints with colored pens and writing down all the synapses, so an enormous effort, and that's why it took so long. And it, because of that effort, no one attempted to do this uh, in the intervening time. But meanwhile, computers have uh, come along, and so we thought, how can we reapproach the problem of getting more C. elegans connectomes? And in particular, we wanted the connectome of the male, knowing the male had a complex behavior and a complex region of its nervous system different from the hermaphrodite. So um, I'll show you the mating behavior of a male worm in a movie. And uh, 
uh, if you look at the panel on the right, what you're going to see in the movie is this series of steps where the male uh, responds to contact, backs up while pressing its tail uh, against the hermaphrodite, turns around the hermaphrodite, and it's trying to locate the vulva. Uh, it has hardened structures called spicules inside that it's going to vibrate as soon as it detects the vulva, and it's trying to insert those spicules into the vulva. When it achieves that, uh, it will transfer sperm, and the sperm will, will go into the hermaphrodite where they fertilize the hermaphrodite's eggs, uh, and then the male will swim away. So, Tracy, can we have that movie? Okay, so I hope you can see those various steps that I mentioned. Uh, it's a multi-step behavioral pathway. Uh, not all of those steps uh, need to be taken by the male. If he encounters the vulva immediately, it immediately responds and tries to insert its spicules. So uh, this is uh, the input-output behavior, the input through sensory neurons that the male is using to detect its location on the hermaphrodite. It has to make a decision. What, where am I on the hermaphrodite? What should I do? Should I make a turn? Should I insert my spicules? Uh, am I ready to transfer a sperm? This is the input-output function, the, the behavioral pathway um, that uh, we want to understand how the nervous system uh, creates this. So. Um, the uh, male has specialized uh, sensory neurons uh, in, uh, in its tail that guides this process. Uh, there are structures, sensory structures that extend from the, the body called rays. Uh, each ray has two endings of two sensory neurons in it. Uh, there's sensilla around the cloaca, called post-cloacal sensillum and the hook. Uh, and then the spicules themselves have sensory neurons inside that detect when the spicules are inserted into the hermaphrodite vulva. Altogether, there are 52 sensory neurons in 25 sensilla in the male tail that guide this process. So that's the input function. Uh, the output um, is uh, the guidance of these various muscle groups that are, are arranged to create the behavior. Um, so there are body wall muscles which are present in the hermaphrodite as well, but those are engaged by the male to uh, locomote and hold its body during uh, mating. Uh, then there are uh, specialized male muscles only found in the male called diagonal muscles, which would cause the, the body to curl. Uh, and then there are a set of male-specific sex muscles around the cloaca uh, that hold and open the cloaca and, and control the spicules uh, and uh, bringing them in and out. Uh, altogether, 64 muscles, 24 shared uh, with the hermaphrodite and 40 which are male-specific. Uh, so here, just to give you an impression of how these muscles work, here are the, the, the spicule retractors and protractors which make the spicules go out like that, in and out 
just to give you an example of how these sex specific muscles work. Uh, so um, the Cambridge group, the Brenner group, had made an attempt to determine the connectome of the male, uh, and they completed the reconstruction of a number of neurons, uh, but uh, they didn't finish. And uh, we had the uh, micrographs from their effort available to us, and our job was to see how could we use a computer to make it simpler to analyze uh, these micrographs very quickly. So uh, we designed a program which we call Elegance. Uh, uh, which allows us to make uh, manual annotations of the micrographs. Now, ideally, we would like someday a computer. And to do the human brain, a computer is going to have to analyze these images. But computers, not only in Brenner's day, but even to this day, cannot decipher the way we can uh, these electron micrographs. So we knew we had to do manual annotation, uh, but we wanted to make it uh, quick and easy. So uh, what we do is we load side by side successive serial sections of electron micrographs on the computer screen. And these are digitized images of the electron micrographs worked on in the 1970s uh, by Donna Albertson and others in the, uh, the Brenner group in, in Cambridge, UK. And the, so the numbers, the colored numbers you see, are the numbers they wrote on the micrographs to try and trace through where the neurons are. But what we do is uh, we uh, mark a single point with a mouse in the center of each neurite. So there's one profile, there's another one, there's another one. And then we tell the program which ones are connected across the series of, of sections, the stack of sections, uh, from one uh, image to the next. So those green arrows show that. And then we also mouse click onto the synapses. There's one there. Here at higher magnification, you see the presynaptic density. There's one there, one there, uh, one at this point, the blue arrow. So we enter those and enter which cells are presynaptic and which one's postsynaptic. Finally, all these mouse clicks go into a database and our software creates the maps and synapse lists. In other words, we generate the connectome this way uh, by staring at these uh, mouse clicks, uh, staring at these micrographs and putting in the mouse clicks. It took two people uh, about two years, a year to two years, to complete the reconstruction of the posterior male circuits. Um, so these circuits consist of 144 neurons, uh, 81 specific to the male, 63 are shared with the hermaphrodite. Uh, there are 64 muscles, uh, 40 specific to the male and 24 shared, 3,800 chemical synapses, 1,000 neuromuscular junctions, 3,500 gap junctions. Here's an example of, of one of the neurons. This is a PDB motor neuron. Um, it's uh, present in both sexes, in fact. Here's the cell body in the posterior region, and it runs a, a, a branch around to an axon around to the dorsal side for innervating dorsal muscles. Here's the same neuron reconstructed from the electromicrographs in the male. Here's the cell body. And you can see that the male, this neuron is highly sexually dimorphic, has grown out a, a large extra uh, set of branches in which you have intermingled uh, chemical input, uh, chemical output, and gap junctions in a big mess of, of synapses and a, and a bunch of branches. Uh, this is a typical of the neurons in, in the male ganglion. Uh, they are branchy. And a notable feature is this intermingling of input and output. Uh, there's no clear separation of dendrite and axon in this, uh, in this neuron. Uh, and that means that there's no trigger zone. These are graded potential neurons. They don't have action potentials. Uh, these are typical of uh, C. elegans and many other invertebrates and uh, neurons in your retina. There are many neurons which are analog devices rather than digital devices. The C. elegans nervous system is an analog device. Uh, and uh, you have intermingled input and output and graded potential uh, firing of these neurons. Another feature here you can see is that this is a motor neuron, but it's uh, also got output onto other neurons. So it's in, in a way acting as an interneuron. So it's an intermotor neuron. And this mixed character is also very uh, typical of C. elegans neurons. All right, so here we are. Uh, the sum total of uh, 3,200 connected cell pairs altogether in the connectome. And we can display this like this, and uh, it's pretty bewildering. Uh, so, uh, what are we going to do to uh, try and find circuits? Are there circuits that are discernible? What are the functions of individual neurons? We were faced with this uh, issue after we had completed the, the connectivity. 
And so uh, one thing we did was we turned to a mathematical approach. Um, we used uh, graph theory, which is a field of mathematics that studies the properties of networks. So we have a complex network, interconnected neurons and muscles, um, and there's a large field, very large field of study of the properties of networks. So we took advantage of that, uh, a little bit of math so you can follow. Um, in the field of graph theory, uh, a graph uh, consists of two sets, what's called a graph, not what we normally think of as a graph with two axes and a line, but in, in mathematics, uh, a graph is, is, uh, consists of two sets, it comes from set theory, um, a set of vertices um, and edges, uh, and then, uh, sorry, so two sets, uh, set of vertices, there they are, V1, V2, V3, uh, a bunch of vertices or nodes, and then uh, a set of edges, and each edge consists of pairs of vertices, one, three, one, seven, two, three, and so forth. Um, that's what a mathematical graph is. There's two ways that this can be, these sets can be represented. One is as a network, like this. So here you see the nodes and the edges. So the nodes, the vertices, are the neurons or muscles in our nervous system. Um, the edges uh, can be of two types. They can be directed. They go in a certain direction. They represent um, the synapses and directed edges in particular are chemical synapses or rectifying gap junctions. If, if, they, uh, if there are any rectifying gap junctions, we don't know. Um, and uh, then there may be undirected edges if, uh, which represent gap junctions that are uh, not rectifying. So this is one way that our graph can be represented and it's a typical way we draw a, a, a network. Um, but this is a second way, and a very important way. Uh, a graph can be represented as an adjacency matrix. So uh, two vertices that are linked by an edge in the network are said to be adjacent in the network. And uh, so here's uh, the matrix of those adjacencies. Um, here's the pairs of vertices on the horizontal and vertical axes. Uh, this is a directed graph, a directed uh, graph of the chemical synapses. So on this side we have the presynaptic neurons, on the top we have the postsynaptic neurons. Now, you can see here that this already is showing us some details and patterns which we couldn't see in that first representation I showed you of this hairball network that if you just arrange the uh, nodes randomly and connect them with lines you get a, a hairy mess. Here we're starting to see some order. Uh, and this is our task to, in, in deciphering how this network functions, is to order the nodes and vertices and group them in such ways that we can start to see the patterns of their connectivity. So uh, how have these been ordered? They've been ordered in hierarchical fashion. So he, these are the sensory neurons, these are the interneurons, the motor neurons, and these are the muscles. So they're going down uh, the, the uh, the, the hierarchy, uh, the information flow from input to output, uh, and that's already helped us arrange, uh, to see some patterns. We've arranged the sensory neurons in single scintilla together, muscles in single groups together, and we start to see these patterns. Um, now, if we look at the JC matrix at a higher uh, magnification, we can see that each of these connections uh, has a number, um, as low as one, uh, as high as, here's 172, it goes 1 to 100. These represent the strengths of the connections between the neuron on the left and the neuron at the top. Uh, how do we get these strengths? Uh, these represent the number of serial sections. This is the physical size of these connections. Uh, the number of serial sections in the electromyograph. So we can do this in the worm as a, a proxy for um, synapse size, an estimate of synapse size because we have a worm, the neurons are running in the AP direction, and as they go along they make en passant synapses. Here you see presynaptic density and synaptic vesicles. Now our serial sections are transverse to the worm, and so by simply counting up the number of serial sections traversed by synapses, uh, we can get uh, a number for the physical size of the connection. And so this is, uh, gives us a, a proxy for the strength of the connection. We don't know um, how, what the activity of these connections is. We don't know whether they're excitatory or inhibitory, so we don't know the sign of the, um, 
uh, of the connection, uh, but it's a first estimate for the strength. It's the morphological strength. And so here, uh, these are called the weights of the edges. Each edge has a value and a weight. Uh, and uh, as I said, we don't know whether the sign on these weights is plus or minus, excitatory inhibitory, but it's the first uh, uh, pass at uh, determining the strengths of the connections, first estimate. And this numerical quantitative adjacency matrix is the form of the graph that math mathematics can take hold of, can uh, work with this. Um, and so there are many algorithms and, and uh, approaches, uh, analyses to understanding uh, properties of these networks based on the JC matrix, and we took advantage of them. One in particular uh, was we asked whether the graph was modular. So modularity in a graph or communities in a graph are, are partitions of a network or graph uh, where each of those communities contains more connections between the vertices in that community than those vertices are connected to the vertices in other communities. And there are algorithms available to, to partition and find an optimal partitioning of a network to, uh, in this way. And we took advantage of those and found that in fact the male uh, network is highly modular. Uh, and in fact, the mathematics looking only at the amount of connections between the neurons and muscles, knowing nothing about the biology, uh, gave us five modules that fit the biology beautifully. Uh, so for example, uh, here the first module we call the response module uh, has a subset of the ray neurons which we knew from experimental work triggered the male to respond to the hermaphrodite and start to back up. And uh, those Ray neurons interfaced onto interneurons, which then interfaced onto the motor system. So the second module grouped the command interneurons, the motor neurons, body wall muscles all together to drive the worm forward and backward. Um, and we call that the locomotion model module. Two modules appear to be uh, for uh, holding the worm's posture as it mates. Uh, and uh, why am I not? advancing, uh, oh, there we go. Um, so uh, one uh, of these modules contains those diagonal muscles I mentioned and a different subset of ray neurons which innervate those and that would cause the, uh, the tail to curl. Um, another module has output onto dorsal and ventral body wall muscles but not through the locomotion circuit. So we think that also is for um, uh, holding the posture of the worm. And then finally, the last module is, is we call the insemination module because it has the neurons and muscles around the cloaca and holding the spicules, and uh, it has uh, neurons which have output onto the gonad. Uh, there's the cell body and the synapses, um, and this looks like it's the set of uh, neurons and muscles that will be gauged once the vulva is located. So the response module is before the vulva is located, and the insemination module takes over uh, once the vulva is located. So using these modularity, we can now start to arrange the graph in, in a more orderly and understandable fashion. So here um, we have the uh, four of the five modules. I left out one of the, of the posture modules. Uh, and from top to bottom on the right, um, the uh, neurons and muscles are organized uh, by modules. So there's the response module. Uh, there's the locomotion module. There's the, the posture, one of the posture modules. There's the insemination module. And uh, within the modules, uh, we've grouped neurons of like function into single nodes. So all the rays in the response module or all the, the neurons in the insemination module, the sensory neurons in the insemination module are, are grouped together. That simplifies the picture. And then everything is arranged left to right by its output. So uh, first we have sensory neurons at the top and organs at the bottom. And uh, two types of interneurons emerge from this analysis. Uh, a set of interneurons that impinge on the um, output, on the, the end organs, and a, sense, a set of uh, interneurons uh, that impinge on the, the first layer of interneurons. So we have a layered, multi-layered structure, largely feed forward, and we can see the flow of information from sensory input to motor output in this highly now simplified and more clearly understandable diagram of the, uh, of the system. Now the brain carries out 
some types of computations far faster, more robustly, and with far less energy consumption than a digital computer. And, and this has been known uh, for a long time, and it's been known that the, the brain is a highly massively parallel structure. And so theorists have looked at properties of those kind of, of parallel networks to try and understand uh, how it is that our brain can function so efficiently and so robustly. Um, and uh, speed and efficiency it can be explained by short pathways uh, and highly interconnected neurons. Uh, and uh, we see these features in our circuits. So um, these are additional properties of the network that graph theory can, can give us. For example, uh, how many edges do we have to traverse from one neuron to the next in the network? The average minimum path length in the male mating circuits is just three. So you can get from any neuron to any other neuron. They're all cross-connected to each other by a small number of steps. Uh, another feature of a network that can be analyzed is called the clustering coefficient. Uh, this is the probability that if two neurons are connected to a third, that they're going to be connected to each other. And so that value is about 0.3 for our network. So it's 30% chance that if A and B are connected to C, that A and B are going to be connected to each other. And these properties, average minimum, small minimum path length, uh, small average minimum path length, and uh, high clustering coefficient um, is a property of many networks. And these are called small world networks. This is a small world phenomenon with six degrees of separation between people in, in a social network. Uh, the, the small, world network, small world networks have short path lengths, uh, suggesting rapid communication across the network. Uh, they have high clustering coefficient. Uh, that uh, suggest their local computational units or motifs that uh, are functioning within the network. Um, so uh, speed and efficiency in a small world network, uh, robustness, fault tolerance. You can delete edges and or nodes from a network. Uh, in the field, they like to say that the performance of the network degrades gracefully as you remove vertices and edges. And this certainly is true of nervous systems as well. Um, and th this property can be explained by having multiple parallel pathways and extensive, extensive divergent and convergent connectivity. So for example, uh, so uh, divergent connectivity. If a single neuron uh, innervates two different neurons, uh, and convergent connectivity, two neurons innervate the same uh, downstream neuron. And we see this extensively in the male circuits. Uh, and to illustrate these points of parallel uh, uh, connections um, and short path lengths, I, I show you the circuits that uh, innervate one set of muscles, these eight cloacal muscles, the two, uh, four pairs, a gubernacular erector and gubernacular retractor, which do this. They raise the structure over the cloaca and the anterior and posterior obliques, which function like this. All right, these neurons, these muscles um, are innervated by the sensory neurons in the postcloacal syncytium. And here I show you just one, the PCA, the A-type postcloacal syncytium on the left side has a cell body where you see it, uh, a, a sensory ending by the cloaca, cell body here, uh, a region where it's making lots of synapses. Um, this shows the connection of, of those eight muscles by all the neurons of the postcloacal syncytium. Now, this is a, a, a graph or network diagram of the connectivity. These don't represent cell bodies and axons. This is just uh, the cell looks like you see at the left. Um, this is a schematic representation uh, and shows you that the muscles are connected in a single synaptic step by these sensory neurons. So here are the very short pathways in the circuit. And here is the value uh, in number of serial sections by which each of those uh, muscles is innervated by the neurons. Now you see each neuron is innervating several muscles, and each muscle is receiving input from several neurons. So there's convergent and divergent connectivity in this group. Uh, I got to the end of that set. Hold on. OK. Um, so uh, there are additional connections that will unify the function of this group. The muscles are connected together by gap junctions, as you see here. And the sensory neurons are highly cross-connected to each other. Uh, so all of these cross-connections are going to make this uh, 
function as a unit and coordinate its activity. So in a way, the, the output of the system is built into this connectivity. So by all this cross-connectivity, we're going to have the neurons reinforcing each other, the sensory neurons reinforcing each other's output by having output onto other sensory neurons and to make a robust signal that will activate this set of muscles in a uniform way. So uh, a large fraction of the input into muscles is directly from sensory neurons. The pathways are very short uh, reflex pathways guiding the, the male's quick reflexes during mating. Um, so uh, what about interneurons? What do they do if sensory neurons are, are innervating muscles? Well, they don't only innervate muscles. Uh, for example, the PCA, the A-type neuron in the postcalacal sensillum, 27% uh, of its output is onto an interneuron, a male-specific interneuron called PBX which has output onto the body wall motor system. Now, PCA also has output onto a set of interneurons called CP neurons, and these have output onto the PVX. So the CP neurons are in the, 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 mid, the top layer of interneurons, and the PVX is in the second layer towards the, uh, the output end that I showed you earlier. Uh, and this creates a motif that is known in the field, the motif field, as a feed-forward loop. And this occurs very frequently in our circuits and also is very commonly found in natural circuits. Uh, natural networks is found in the human brain. Um, here's another example of a, of a feed forward loop where we have um, the circuits that are uh, in the insemination module. Here's the post and psyllium sensory neurons. Uh, the cholecal muscles I've been talking about. Uh, here's an innervation of the gonad by a post cholecal neuron. Your body wall muscles are part of this. We think the body contracts during insemination, during ejaculation. Now, all of these muscles also receive input from this, this set of CP uh, neurons, uh, which also receive input from all of the, uh, of the sensory neurons. So, this is a tremendously convergent and divergent uh, connectivity. All of the end organs will receive some input from all of the, of the sensory neurons via this CP uh, interneuron in this feed-forward loop. So there, there's a, the cell bodies of the CP neurons, and this is where they're making uh, synapses onto the, uh, to the gonad. So there are two types of feed-forward loops, theoretically. There's a, a so-called coherent feed-forward loop, uh, in which the signs of the two pathways are the same, and then an incoherent loop where we get a change of sign. We think our feed-forward loops are all of a coherent type uh, because it wouldn't make sense for they're, they're all these neurons are, are focusing on promoting the same activity. And here's another example uh, where the ray sensory neurons innervate a PDY interneuron and also via LUA. Uh, Rene Garcia has shown that if you remove the LUA interneuron from this loop, the males mate perfectly normally until you tap the plate, and then they get disrupted and swim away. So uh, it looks like a, a normal male is resistant to outside disturbance while it's mating, and the function of this LUA feed-forward loop would be to reinforce the output of PVY stimulated by the ray sensory neurons and keep this pathway going probably as a, as a coherent feed-forward loop. Uh, this kind of connectivity, as I mentioned, is, is highly overrepresented in many natural networks. Uh, so network features that, that help explain network function, short pathways, highly interconnected neurons, repeated small motifs and feed forward loops, uh, robustness is highly fault tolerant because there are so many multiple parallel pathways with convergent and divergent connectivity. Uh, now, uh, the theorists have analyzed the properties of artificial neural networks to try and understand how the brain can function. And uh, two types of theoretical uh, artificial neural networks have been studied extensively. One is called perceptron, introduced by Rosenblatt in 1962. Uh, it's a layered feed-forward network, just like our network, with an input layer, an output layer, an intermediate layer, and these can be used to uh, detect patterns if the weights are set properly between the input and output uh, nodes. Uh, the, the output, you can get a certain output depending on different inputs uh, by this uh, neural network. 
another type um, was introduced by Hopfield who pointed out that if you have feedback in the circuit as well, then you get a so-called attractor network that will have self-reinforcing behavioral states uh, and will eventually fall into certain patterns of, of connectivity, of, of output that are reinforced. And Hopfield pointed out this is like uh, having a memory stored in the network. Now, to get certain memories or certain input-output function in a perceptron, one has to, the theorists have to figure out what weights to put between the vertices or between the nodes. And so they have learning algorithms, they have training sets that tra teach and iteratively adjust the weights uh, to get the kind of performance they're looking for. Now when we teach or when we train, we gain knowledge, and so the weights of the network can in a way be considered the knowledge that the network has of its environment or what it should do. Uh, so the weights in the structural JC matrix that we've determined represent some of the worm's knowledge uh, about its environment. And it's a fascinating way to think about it. This knowledge is encoded in the genome. Uh, these are genetically specified network connections. These are innate behaviors in the worm. Uh, and uh, so there are genes in the genome that determine the weights of all these connections, and we don't really know what those genes are. There are many candidates, but we basically have no idea how the JC matrix is encoded in the genome. Uh, the learning algorithms in our case must have been natural selection over many, many generations, of course, um, and connectivity and, and hence behavior can evolve by gradual changes in the weights of the connection, something we'll be able to understand when we know how the connections are specified to begin with. So just to reemphasize this point, this complex pattern of connections with specific weights is genetically specified in some unknown way. It's a major exciting problem for us to think about in the future, how this can be specified. So uh, we would like to compute behavior. How the network is specified, of course, is the problem of how is it built that Brenner posed initially. The other question is how does it work? Uh, and we would, could say that we uh, understand how it works uh, if we could compute behavior. So we know the set of inputs. We know the worm's internal state, its motivational state. We can predict exactly what its outlook could be. That would be really understanding behavior. Uh, and the structural connectome that I've described is a first step towards this goal, but it's only a first step. Uh, for reverse engineering the network, uh, we need the functional connectome. Uh, we have a static structure, but of course the network, uh, the nervous system is a dy dynamic uh, structure. We need the signs of the weights. We need to know whether they're excitatory or inhibitory. We need really the functional strength, not just the morphological size. Um, and we need to know how the activity can be modulated as the network functions. The neurons change, synaptic weights change as over time as the network functions. We need to know what the hidden edges are, what I call hidden edges. There are connections between neurons which we can't see in the physical structure because they occur independently of synapses. So these are transsynaptic, uh, so these are, are uh, extrasynaptic um, hormonal, for example, or neuropeptide signaling that occurs between cells that are not necessarily connected by synapse. We have to know what those are. Um, so the structural connectome tells us what neurons can communicate over short time scales. So I don't mean to imply that it doesn't have any use in understanding behavior at all. Uh, the extrasynaptic uh, communication is much slower than a worm mating, uh, typically. And so the quick reactions uh, can only go over the structural connectome, and uh, this uh, restricts how we can think about how this much worse works uh, greatly. Um, so fortunately, we can get the additional information we need from experiments. Uh, we can do calcium imaging and voltage sensitive imaging to observe the neurons functioning. We can perturb the neurons by cell ablations. Uh, we can block and activate uh, neurotransmission experimentally. Um, we can uh, activate cells by optogenetic tools experimentally. And then, of course, we can use genetics to determine the components that are, are important. Uh, so finally, to summarize, uh, we have a second connectome. It's the first structural description of a natural neural network with measured weights. I didn't emphasize that. In the earlier hermaphrodite reconstruction, weights were not measured with the precision that we've been able to do it using our computerized approach. Uh, computer assistance has brought determination of new connectomes within reach, uh, and the measured weights make a mathematical analysis possible, 
And even with a nervous system consisting of a few hundred neurons, mathematical analysis was necessary to decipher network structure. So a whole new aspect of the phenotype is now available to us. It's extremely exciting. The further improvements in methodology going on in a number of connectomics laboratories uh, for connecting long unbroken series of sections, more rapid and large-scale electron microscopy, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, computer analysis of micrographs is going to absolutely be necessary to do larger structures. All these techniques are being worked on, developed rapidly, and under the BRAIN initiative will be uh, pursued uh, extensively. And so with these new methods, we're looking forward to new C. elegans connectomes. We want to do the male head, which in fact we have completed the male head. And the comparison of the two sexes shows that in the head, the, the circuits are essentially the same between the two sexes, although there are some, some male-specific connections. We want to look at how the connectivity develops during larval development. We want to be able to analyze the connectivity by mutants or after learning or environmental influences to see if the environment can change the connectivity in the worm. And finally, other animals are now coming within reach, other nematode species. We can look at evolution of connectivity, other small animals, a sound of the sea squirts being worked on at Dalhousie University, uh, zebrafish, drosophila, uh, and finally, small parts of larger nervous systems like the retina, uh, and uh, someday, although it's still very large, a, a cortical column of parts of our own nervous system. So it's an exciting time uh, where we're, we're starting to see an aspect of the nervous system which is essential to know to understand how the circuits function. Uh, and we're going to see new information uh, coming out uh, very soon uh, in, in this uh, area of, uh, of neuroscience. So with that, I would like to acknowledge the people that contributed to the work in my lab and to this talk. The, the more movies were provided by a number of, of laboratories. And I want to acknowledge the uh, C. elegans research community is a tremendously cooperative, exciting group of people that we share our materials. And it's been just a spectacular group of people uh, to work with in, in a career in science. Uh, images and graphics uh, from Worm Atlas, uh, Chris Crocker in the Einstein Graphics Department. Electromicrographs from the Cambridge group, Donna Albertson, uh, Ken Nguyen, Nickel Thompson. Uh, image registration by Hurt Wetzel and Greg Hood at the Research Supercomputing Center. Software was initially made by MetaHelix Life Sciences and then developed by Meng Shu in my laboratory extensively. And then finally, the connections were the micrographs were scored by Travis Jarrell, Yi Wang, and analyzed by Adam Bloniars, Christopher Britton, uh, Stephen Cook. And of course, my collaborator, David Hall, has been part of this project. Uh, and finally, for support, um, software development was initially funded by NIH. But the Connectomics project itself uh, was funded by the G. Harold and Lila Y. Mathers Charitable Foundation. And they should receive tremendous recognition for their support of this, uh, of this project. Uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, I've really. Uh, run uh, my full hour, but they tell me I can take a few more minutes for uh, Q&A. So let me look at uh, uh, the, the questions and see uh, if there are some. Uh, if every individual's connectomes are different, are there certain common patterns across connections? If yes, what do... Uh, I don't see the rest of the question. Oh, here we go. Are there certain... If yes, what does that imply? I don't know if you're talking about every individual human or every individual worm. Um, the, uh, the worm connectomes are not different. Worm connectivity in the worm nervous system is uh, quite consistent and stereotyped. Um, and, uh, but of course, in humans, there will be differences. And, but are there going to be common patterns? Absolutely. For example, this motif that I mentioned, the feed for motif, is something that recurs uh, in uh, in nervous system. So hopefully the problem of getting the human connectome is going to be simplified uh, if we can see subparts of it uh, that um, are repeated. And so we don't have to decide for the connectivity in all of them. We can recognize units and, and uh, put them together and build up uh, with, with building blocks that way. So that's the only question I have. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, it's been fun to uh, present this today, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, it's been uh, enlightening to those of you who, who heard this talk. Thanks very much.